So let me um, start by introducing um, uh, House Representative Julie Von Hafen. Um, she is an attorney and she's a certified guardian ad litem in Wake County. She has three children in the public school system. Um, I met her first when she was uh, very active in the PTA and she was actually the president of the Wake County PTA as well as her involvement with the North Carolina PTA Board of Directors. Um, she received her bachelor's degree in Ohio University um, and her law degree from Case Western Reserve University. Uh, she practiced law for 10 years in a variety of areas, can, um, including criminal law, medical malpractice, defense, municipal law, and education law, which really helps her uh, very well in her job as our representative for District 36 in the North Carolina House. Um, next, I want to uh, quickly introduce to you um, Senator Gladys Robinson. Uh, Dr. Robinson is serving her sixth term and she represents the um, North Carolina 28, Senate District 28. She is a healthcare professional and she's a senior member of the North Carolina Senate. Um, she's always the go-to person for me in the Senate when it comes to anything ha that has to do with children and public education and is certainly healthcare. So she also serves as the North Carolina, South Carolina co-chair of the National Black Caucus of the State Legislators for Region 5, very uh, big job. Um, she's on the Governor's State Health Coordinating Council, and she's first vice president of the North Carolina Legislative Black Caucus. She's a graduate of Bennett College and has earned both a master's in education and counseling and her doctorate in leadership studies from North Carolina A&T University. So I think you can see we have some, the experts here in the Senate and the House two fabulous women who are well accomplished and very knowledgeable in the issues of public education. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, Senator and Representative for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. I'm just, this is a brief look at our agenda this evening. We're gonna start talking about the state budget and 2021 legislation. We'll then talk a little bit about the Leandro court case and then what's ahead in the 22, 2022 short session. We will also have Q&A with um, attendees at the end of the program. In my view, anytime we talk about public school funding um, with regard to the state budget in particular, it's very important to frame that discussion. So this is just a reminder and a look at how critical the state budget is to North Carolina public schools. And again, to frame our conversation, here are some of our rankings. We are currently 49th in the United States in funding effort. Funding effort is the amount of money that is spent on public education relative to your state's economy. We are 39th in per pupil spending and we are 33rd in teacher pay. And again, I just think this is important um, framing the discussion as we talk about the state budget. And Yvonne will take us from here. So uh, Senator Robinson and Representative uh, Von Hafen, I'd like for you to maybe, these are three, four areas that come up are questions to our organization all the time. What's going on with teacher pay? How about non-certified staff pay? Um, what's going on with, you know, keeping teachers and finding teachers? What's going on with vouchers? Um, and how are we raising money? Oh, and what's going on with this, this business tax rate? So this is, these are the issues. And I thought maybe it would be great if you could just talk a little bit, um, anyone can go first, about kind of what has happened on these issues in the last, you know, with the budget passing and the, and the session so far. Um, so um, whoever would like to speak first, please do, but kind of, kind of let our audience know and, and, you know, where we are and what happened. Well, well, I guess I'll start since the uh, Senate is a bit more conservative than the House has been, <laughs> and I appreciate the, the House pushing forward because the, the Senate uh, has not been kind to public schools uh, as far as I see in terms of our leadership. Uh, and everyone is aware of um, the 5% raise over the two years 
we had proposed from the Democratic caucus that we do 5% each year. Uh, and because that's barely any money when you say two and a half percent and and then there's a, a gap for those who had what 18 16 to 24 years of service who really didn't get anything so it's it, we really didn't do a good job as far as I'm concerned uh, especially since we need to retain teachers uh, and uh, one of the other things that I was extremely concerned about and I voted against the budget because of that um, that Guilford County didn't get uh, the supplemental funds. Uh, and it really put us at an additional disadvantage because it means that our teachers can be attracted by surrounding counties who really got the supplement and will have higher salaries uh, than the, you know, average 52, 53,000 or whatever that is. They'll, they'll be able to attract these teachers because it's easy to drive to those counties. And Guilford County doesn't have that supplement, uh, even though it was 12th in terms of, when you looked at the chart, in terms of where a teacher pay was and the supplements. Uh, so we're at an additional disadvantage in terms of that. Uh, I am concerned, extremely concerned that uh, knowing what we need to do, how we need to address the needs of children, that we, uh, and I'm saying we in terms of legislative leadership, don't see the importance of valuing teachers, making sure we have the best teachers, but and that they are paid well uh, to do a tremendous job. Uh, they did a little bit better in certified, in uh, non-certified staff in terms of raising it, uh, the, the pay, hourly pay to $13 an hour uh, for 20, what is it, 22, 23, <laughs> uh, but, but for the next two years and then to uh, 15, $15 an hour in 23, 24. So that's a little bit better. Uh, but I'll stop there and, and, uh, and let Julie talk because the house did, had it not been for pushing some of the, uh, the house's budget, uh, the conference report would have ended up uh, being worse. Thank you, Senator. Um, yeah, I mean, I would agree that uh, I also voted against the budget because of primarily because of the education budget was just not sufficient in my eyes. I mean, I know a lot of people felt like that that very small 2.5%, you know, raise that the Senator mentioned was a win, but in my eyes, that raise doesn't even keep up with inflation. Um, it's, you know, if you really look at the salaries, it's like a maybe less than $100, you know, a month. Um, you know, it's it's a very, very small when you really look at it in the in the grand scheme of of the salary schedule. And so it's it's really not a raise if you really look at it um, compared to inflation. But like the senator mentioned, um, you know, getting that non-certified uh, pay up to that $15 an hour in a second year is an important win because that uh, we raised the rate for all state uh, employees in 2017, but it didn't include those non-certified staff. So at least, you know, they are now in the same category or will be, you know, next year. Um, I don't know why we couldn't do it this year immediately and we had, why we had to do the step uh, from 13 and then to 15, but um, that's what they agreed to. So I, we do have to take, you know, with the wins where we can get them. Um, you know, some of the other uh, issues that you mentioned on the slide, um, I'll just say, you know, teacher pipeline, obviously this is a major problem and a major issue that we got to address in North Carolina. We've seen enrollment and all our teacher preparation programs dropping over the last, you know, five to 10 years, um, really since the Republicans have taken over the General Assembly, you know, people are not wanting to go into teaching and it's it's now getting apparent as the number of openings and, you know, staff openings across our state are huge. The Senator mentioned, you know, these this um, supplemental fund, if you're not aware of this, it was a large amount of money that was going to be distributed in the way that it was kind of discussed was that it was going to help, you know, 
maybe counties and LEAs that don't have like the property tax base, you know, that a lot of counties use to raise money for uh, a public employee or public school employee salaries, but it wasn't given to the five largest counties in North Carolina, uh, which all happen to be pretty democratic counties, including, you know, Guilford, Wake, uh, Mecklenburg, um, Buncombe. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's it seems like a big coincidence, but so we did not get, I'm from Wake County, we did not get those supplements. And so um, that is going to create, like the Senator said, you know, a lot of those inequities in, in hiring. The budget did include some money, you know, for like community and schools, um, you know, some of the important projects like that, but we, we are not investing nearly enough in professionalizing our workforce and, you know, compensation and benefits and PD opportunities, you know, that we really need to um, strengthen that pipeline. And then finally, I'll just mention the, the voucher expansion and then maybe if the Senator wants to touch on it again. Um, the voucher program is, is really, in my opinion, just getting out of control um, this year in the budget. We have now removed the cap for all new vouchers for children entering kindergarten and first grade. We've, we hear in the General Assembly all the time that the voucher program is supposed to be for, to help low-income families you know, access private education. But now the eligibility for these vouchers has now increased to 278% of the federal poverty level. Now you might say, well, I don't know what that means. Basically, for a family of four, you can be making $72,705 um, and still be able to access these voucher programs. To me, that's not a low income family. I mean, that is, you know, that is not really, we shouldn't be increasing the eligibility for these programs. It's it's also that these vouchers are not showing any progress in how they're assisting these students. Um, it's not showing data that families are being benefited from the program. And millions of dollars are sitting in this program and being not used, which is another huge problem that we need to um, be addressing. And you know, instead of increasing the eligibility, maybe we shouldn't be continuing to put money into the program year after year after year. So I'll stop there and toss it back to the Senator. Maybe she wants to comment on a couple of those things before we move on. I wanted to yeah. do a follow up quickly with um, Senator Robinson. One of the things I was thinking about when we were looking at this pay level, you know, we we're like 49th in effort. We used to be 42nd, we're 33, 39, whatever number we throw out there, it's always very low. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about 2010. In 2010, uh, when you started serving in the General Assembly, we were making some progress. We had been making progress. We had been up to almost 25th in the nation. Um, it must be very disheartening to you to, you know, to kind of listen to this, this conversation, because we've got 12 years later, and we really haven't made any progress. Uh, would you agree? Well, I, I do agree. And it is quite disappointing, because I came into the Senate expecting to be able to uh, collaborate with folk and to, to, you know, continue to move that uh, that pay level up for teachers. And I had served on the uh, public school forum uh, uh, board. And, you know, we had looked at things like professional development. How do we keep our teachers in the classroom who want to stay as opposed to, you know, moving to administrative roles? Because that's so very important. And, you know, pay is part of it, but the career development piece is the other part, too. Uh, so I thought we were moving in a great direction, but I soon found out after a couple of sessions that, oh, wow, people, uh, it appears that the Republicans just dislike teachers. I cannot figure that out. And I said on the floor that they were taught by teachers. So what is the dislike for teachers? And, and so we have to be able uh, to, to make some progress there else we continue to lose them. The other thing too, is that they cut the teaching fellows program out and I had been uh, involved with that as well too. And, and so 
that really cut the pipeline for a very long time. Now they're implementing um, a, a similar teaching fellows program is called something else, can't remember, uh, and including some of the HBCUs in that as well. But, you know, we're far behind. We are far behind and, and it's not good. Uh, we don't attract or keep our, our good teachers, our best teachers, uh, and, and that's bad. And you can't expect people to just stay all the time because they love the job. Uh, they need a way to live and to support their families as well. Well, you know, Julie made the comment about the two and a half and how small that was. And I do think it's important to remind our audience that that's after four years. I mean, that's over four years if you really want to look at it. We had two years with no raises, nothing right. happened. We didn't have a budget. And so all those teachers, those, those non-certified staff, every, all those folks in that school building really saw nothing for two years Absolutely. while the cost of living was going up. And so if you take that, <laughs> if you take that 5% over two years and think about it, it's really 5% over four years it is even more sad in terms of how much teachers are actually losing by uh, keeping their jobs. Um, before I, I, I ask you, uh, we, I'm kind of jumping around here because we're kind of getting into some things that might be later in the conversation, but I think it's important right now. You mentioned um, the Teaching Fellows Program. That has, um, in that it's, it's, a, there, it's been revived in a new name and a new effort. We haven't seen that the program has been offered at any historically black colleges and universities. Um, is that possible this coming year? I mean, what's going on there? Well, yes, the plans are to offer it at uh, some of the HBCUs. And um, so I am not, I know that um, I believe Fayetteville State uh, and at one point, North Carolina A&T was involved with teaching fellows before uh, years and years ago in terms of trying to groom teachers. So uh, I believe those two, I may be wrong, but there are a couple of our uh, HBCUs uh, that are involved. Well, plan to get involved once, plan, this, budget right. was, yeah, I, once this budget <laughs> was approved. They had planned I, think, I think that's important to mention because it, you, I think you're extremely point on, um, Senator, because we, we relied on this teaching fellows program to fund a lot of teachers uh, uh, right. at a full ride at many of their schools, all of the HBCUs, as well as many of our public universities. And when that had, was cut off, that was like a real huge um, busting the pipe, so to speak, in the teacher's pipeline. Julie also mentioned um, um, the issue around vouchers. And oh, yeah. one of the things that we at Public Schools First keep looking at is that big pot of money um, that they keep adding money every year. I mean, what should we do about talking to our legislators about just that pot of money? I mean, how do we free that up? Well, I, well, I think you, you need to look at really the full picture. When that when the voucher started in 2017, 18, it would only fund, I believe about, um, it may have been 1700. I can't remember the number because I don't have my notes in front of me. I couldn't print them. Uh, but with the increase over the years, what's going to happen by 26, 27, the, the based on the funding that is, is uh, appropriated forward, it will fund at least 31, 32,000 um, children. Now, the concern I have there is look at the impact on public schools. Look at the impact, not only in terms of uh, against what our constitution says that we should support public schools. It doesn't say anything about us using public dollars to support private schools. But then we're putting, if you put that money in there, parents take their children out, send them to private schools with public money, then you've taken away from public school systems. And to me, that is just detrimental. It's terrible in terms of what's going on. And of course, the money is, as a representative said a minute ago, is sitting there and it really should have been taken out as opposed to adding money to it. But they saw fit. And that was, I, I, you know, I really have to say it was because of their own little personal 
initiatives. Some people they knew, private schools that they were affiliated with, that kind of thing. You know, uh, like one told me on the floor, he homeschooled his or whatever, you know. So <laughs> I, folks are interested in funding their private schools. And it's all right to send your children, but we should not be paying for it with public dollars that belong to the public schools because we're taking away from public schools. And, you know, we've seen, um, Representative, we've seen figures that even show that um, we thought that this year coming year it was going to be like 85,000 for a family and four on one of the measures they're using. Um, so even with it 72 to 85, that's a big, that's a, that's a, um, and at the 85% figure, um, Senator and Representative, we, there was uh, one estimate we saw that that would cover like, you know, 70% of the families with children in North Carolina. So that's not just dealing with low income kids who are struggling. That is, um, and in some rural counties, it would be 80% of the families. So we see that this is like um, um, not quite sticking to the goal, if we should say, for the vouchers program. One last question for each of you. When we talk about this teacher pipeline, because we think it's in a crisis, we see the crisis we're in, and COVID certainly has pushed that along. But do you see any hope in the horizon? Is there anything that you're working on personally or anything that you think that we can be doing locally as well as at state to, to um, improve the situation? Anything that you want to suggest that we do, that we work on as a community advocates? Julie, I'll let you take a stab at it. <laughs> I mean, for me, I mean, you know, which we're going to talk about later is is Leandro and just pushing for the Leandro funding in the Leandro case because the first tenant of the Leandro decision and the West Ed report is the fact that we have to place a well prepared high quality teacher in every classroom and the Leandro case in the West Ed report and the bill that I filed this last year you know has about 20 different things that we need to be doing in order to meet that obligation. And it, it's a variety of different things. It's, you know, um, supporting the teaching fellows program. It's, you know, doing recruitment bonuses for low wealth, low performing schools. You know, it's expanding, um, you know, the drive program, which is a, a program for more equitable, you know, teaching roles, you know, recruiting minorities, you know, to teach in classrooms. Um, you know, doing money to go to the Office of Equity Affairs at DPI. I mean, there's so many different things. It's not just one solution. We have to look at it. And I'm sure you've heard this. If you heard anything about Leander, and this is something I talk about a lot when I talk about it at the General Assembly is, you know, this is, it's not just like pick and choose. We have to do all of these things if we want to make significant changes, you know, and really invest in this pipeline. I mean, it's not just, okay, let's expand the teaching fellows program check we're done no i mean it's like we have to do all these things in order to to really make a difference um okay and senator i wanted to give you a chance to respond before i move on to the next section well and and i guess i'll wait to talk about leandro but i think the i think they're they probably are linked together is is why uh the representative talked about them because you know, to address that, we've got to pay teachers more. Uh, we've got to pay teachers more to attract them to work with uh, the children who are not achieving, et cetera. Uh, so I, I guess we have to look at some creative ways. Someone asked me the other day, well, Senator, you're saying since you've been there, it's gotten worse. Do you see any, <laughs> any improvement? And I said, well, you know, all Republicans aren't bad. Uh, all of those in the Senate, some have uh, education as a concern, but they are, I think they oftentimes, uh, their hands are being slapped um, in terms of trying to move forward to assist with some of these, some of these bills that, that we have coming forward. Uh, and I'm told that the Republicans, uh, Berger is saying, well, you know, we're going to continue to increase. We're going to continue to increase. Well, in, you know, in, inflation keeps going up. And, and so by 
by the time you increase them a little bit every time, they're still way below. Uh, right. So I think we just have to keep trying uh, wherever we can to, to get teacher pay up. Uh, and, and then also to, to fund public schools in general. Now we were blessed, you know, the blessing out of COVID is the money that came. <laughs> uh, uh, so we were blessed with that, but people need to realize that the legislature used most of the federal money to fund education rather than using our state dollars. And we've got all of this money, $9 billion sitting aside and we could have used that money to plug the holes, but we used, you know, and, and that was our complaint. Why in the world are you doing this? Use it as an additional resource, but they used uh -huh. it, you know, to fund to replace. Uh -huh. Yes, they did. To replace, right. So we, we agree with you and to kind of, uh, I'll just kind of say a few summary comments here and I'm gonna to move to the last thing and that'll take us to our next slide which is I think that overall public school advocates out there were certainly with you representative and Senator and saying we got some, we got some progress in the budget, but overwhelmingly there's a, there's a tremendous amount of disappointment that what we got for teacher pay and for teacher support, there was, you know, we did not reinstate uh, the uh, master's pay the way we should. We did not reinstate uh, the uh, having health care for people when they teachers when they retired. We did not uh, reinstate um, longevity. There's so many things that teachers feel that you know that we waited and waited four years later. Here's the budget, and we did not get the pay that we were hoping and the and feeling that our communities deserve. And we and we also hear a tremendous amount of concern. We may bring you back to talk about just this topic later about the teacher pipeline. And of course, the, the voucher uh, program, um, Senator and Representative does kind of concern everyone because there is this pot of money not being spent. There is no evidence that the money's been spent um, uh, in a way that makes any progress for the children in their schools. And that lack of accountability and transparency of taxpayers' dollars is just sticks in everybody's crawl. But the last thing, and it'll take us to the a couple other slides, is folks have been really complaining about that we have this very low North Carolina corporate tax rate. And now it's going even lower. I think Lynn has a slide coming up. Um, and uh, if you'd like to comment on this, please do and explain to the well, public. Before um, the Senator and Representative comment on it, I just want to, you know, set the stage for our audience. So this is what our corporate tax rate used to be 6.9% in 2013. And when we were at 6.9%, we were not an outlier. We were not the highest in the country. We were not the lowest. But that corporate tax rate has been slashed every budget cycle since 2013. And we were sitting at, in the very bottom. Uh, in 2020 and 2021, at 2.5 percent, we had the lowest corporate tax rate in the United States. And in our view, that was alarming enough because it really hurts your ability, hurts our ability to raise funds and revenue to invest in public services and the public good. And you can see here that Virginia and South Carolina were at 5%. So when we were at 2.5, you know, again, the lowest in the country, even our neighbors to the north and the south of us were not that low or anywhere near that low. And, but this budget is alarming to us because it's going to eliminate the corporate tax rate altogether. And I would love to hear your thoughts about, you know, if you could share with our audience why this is such a huge concern um, and why we should be alarmed by this. Well, I'll start because I want people to realize that uh, it's, it's forecasted that if first they need to realize that education is the largest part of the state's budget. Education first, then health. Uh, and, and, and so our revenue comes from taxes. It comes from taxes, comes from federal government, et cetera. But the largest share is taxes, you know, the corporate tax, the personal income tax, et cetera. So we don't have corporate tax. We are missing a large part. It's forecasted that 
by 2030, when the corporate tax goes to 0%, that in public education, we're going to miss about $8 billion. Now, if we are missing $8 billion, what's going to be cut? What's going to be cut? We're already suffering. Our teachers are suffering. Our children are suffering. You know, we're not doing anything about uh, capital funding in terms of building schools, repairing buildings, et cetera. We're, we're really not doing anything to talk about there. So when it gets to that point, we're going to miss a large part of the revenue. The federal government is not going to fund us. You know, so where are we going to get the money unless somebody comes up with another source of revenue? And we're going to be we're we're going to be sorely hurt in public education. Uh, and and those are these are the children who can't go, you know, can't afford to go to private schools. Um, parents don't make those kinds of choices. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to roll the public education system. That's what the Republicans are doing. They're trying to destroy the public education system. To me, it's just that serious that they are trying to destroy it. And then when we don't have the funding, uh, then you know everything is going to be cut. So I'm I'm extremely concerned. Yeah, I would just add that, I mean, the senator said, well, who's going to pay for it? Well, it, you know, who's going to pay for it? It's going to be all the people sitting on this call and all the low income people across the state, because if we have to raise revenue and we're not getting it from these large corporations who have billions and billions of dollars and can pay for it, then the, the, it's going to be passed on to us in the form of other types of taxes. I'm, I'm sure you've noticed, like, if you go to the DMV, like your fees have been going up and up and up over the last few years. That's called a regressive tax because all those fees are now being pushed down onto us because we need to raise money because we're cutting income tax and we're cutting corporate and we're cutting these out of state corporate taxes. So, I mean, we have to get the money somewhere. And like the Senator said, the federal government isn't gonna bail us out. So, you know who it's gonna to fall to, it's gonna to fall to all of us. And so um, the other thing I just wanna mention is, you know, as Lynn said, you know, the, the, our corporate income tax has always been, you know, within the very like normal range, you know, of states that surround us. And we've always, you know, it's not like we've been an outlier. Well, now we are the outlier, but also as you noticed that as over since 2013, think of all the corporations and business who have come to North Carolina. And it's not because our corporate income tax is so low. If, I mean, you talk to anybody at the Department of Commerce and they'll tell you like what are the reasons that like apple is coming to the triangle or why did amazon build you know this plan or why is toyota coming and building a plan outside of greensboro they'll say it's our workforce they don't talk about the fact that we have the lowest or zero corporate income taxes because we're giving them many many incentives you know to come here anyway and they say it's our workforce it's our education system it's our it's our you know our standard of living you know it's all these other things and so you know by continuing to lower the income tax all or the corporate taxes that all we're doing is hurting all the things that are bringing those companies here they're coming because we have a strong university system and because we have a strong community college system you know what, we're not going to have those things in 10, 20 years when we don't have the money to pay for them anymore. And so it's to me, it's just extremely short sighted to be lowering this corporate income, this corporate tax rate to zero. And it's just it, we're disregarding, you know, what the future of our state really needs and what what it it has to have to be successful. And that's revenue. So I'll there stop are, there. I can go on, but <laughs> there are a couple. I wanted no. I wanted Julie. I'm so glad you mentioned talking to the um, Department of Commerce and and business leaders because I know of two videos in particular of local business executives um, speaking about the fact that that is not the priority. Um, there's a video, a short clip. We actually have it on our YouTube channel of Tom Oxholm speaking about the fact that that's not what attracts businesses. That's not the first thing they're looking at that our corporations are looking at is that corporate tax rate. And in addition to that, um, here in Wake County, 
our uh, former chair of the county commissioners when the deal with Apple was reached. Um, Matt Calabria, the again, the former chair, he said specifically, and we have a video of him saying this too, that when it came down to it, Apple chose Wake County because of our strong school system. They don't have to offer extra salary, extra um, you know, payment for their staff, for their employees to have to pad it for private school tuition like you have to in some other parts of the country. And they cited that specifically and said that very plainly to the leaders in Wake County about why they chose to land here. And it's, it's just critically important. And I'm so, this was really, um, it, it just very alarming to me, to us at Public Schools First NC. And I, I feel like the public really needs to be aware. And, and again, we are, you know, we were already at 2.5%. We were already at the bottom in the US and now we're taking, that wasn't good enough. We're, we got to go to zero, which just baffles me. Um, so I want to I want to keep us moving just so we I'm trying to watch the clock. So real quick in this sort of section, uh, Senator Robinson, you missed it that we're sitting. I mean, it's not missed it. You said it is what I meant to say. You said it already that we're sitting on nine billion dollars of unreserved funds in the state coffers. And that was as of October. I, I was wondering if either of you knew, is it more than that? Well, it's more than 9 billion, but are, have we topped 10 billion at this point? Cause that was three months ago. I have not seen a an updated report. They normally send one, but I haven't seen one. Maybe the representative has, but I, nine is what I, I last heard of. Uh, you know, and, and we know that last year as we were sitting there, and thinking that our revenue was going to be short because of COVID, you know, the revenue kept growing. And we knew that as the budget was being prepared. So there was really no reason for the Republicans uh, not to fund public schools, public education all across. We had plenty of money to, to, uh, to serve our children and to right. serve our teachers. And if it's nine billion or ten billion, you know, you you you're tempted to say, or I'm tempted to say, well, that's neither here nor there. But a, a, an additional billion dollars, I mean, that's it's just really inexplicable. Right. Okay. So let's go on to our next section here, and um, the the thing that I have, think I asked this of one of you, uh, Senator Representative, I can't remember. Are we still in the long session? It's, it feels like we are still moving down. <laughs> we are. <laughs> so we have, for our public, you know, there's a long session that's on the odd years that starts in January. And normally we have a short session that starts in May of the even years. So um, with this long session that's still going on, are there other uh, opportunities for other adjustments uh, or other bills or what's the plan for ending uh, or joining the long session? It's my understanding that we're just staying in session because of the redistricting lawsuits that are going on. And so if the Supreme Court now it's going to the Supreme Court, if they order us to redraw them, then they want to still be in session so that they don't we don't have to be called back. Um, and that the speaker has told us that or told our caucus leader that you know he doesn't anticipate us really taking up any budget adjustments or really doing anything else we're just kind of in a holding pattern i think until this redistricting stuff is worked out and then we'll probably adjourn at some point so i personally didn't anticipate really any major legislation moving forward or anything really being tweaked to the budget at this point the senator have you heard anything differently no, you're you're right, and um, I, we were told the not too long ago that we may go back, you know, after maybe the end of the month or the first of February, anticipating that the Supreme Court will make its decision, uh, and uh, hopefully, you know, we think that uh, they'll determine that some of the maps have to be redrawn. Uh, so that'll take a little time. But after that, I'm, I'm with you in terms of the journey because it's an election year too. Uh, and they want to get out too. <laughs> okay. So one last thing, Senator, um, we, um, Lynn and I, and took a good look at kind of what happened with the bills that did pass. We have lots and lots of bills introduced, only 
about 44 actually that impacted education passed, but um, there weren't any in the House side that really seemed to, to be alarming. But there were these three bills here, the C3 Senate bills, um, Senator, have been brought to our attention or folks have asked us about them or been concerned about them. Could you maybe speak really briefly about this Senate Bill 220 and this requires in-person instruction and especially now in the middle of, you know, the new variant out with COVID. So what was going on with that bill? Well, and, and that that bill actually, I'm not, it, it really was for 2021, uh, just for that particular school year in terms of implementing either plan A or plan B and, and having to do that for, uh, like for plan A, in terms of uh, LEAs implementing a uh, maybe requiring distance uh, in classrooms, but not really having to. And plan B is where they have to uh, require at least six feet, you know, between uh, the children and all. Uh, so that was uh, implemented last year, well, this past year, but for this academic year in terms of that, and it's still in effect uh, throughout this particular academic year. I don't think, and the other thing is, I think people need to realize there's, uh, LEAs do have flexibility uh, and they do have some, you know, this says you can either do this or you can do that, but that gives them some flexibility to determine what they're going to do now. Uh, the problem with that is, um, the other legislation uh, curbed the governor's powers. And whereas the governor heretofore would say, you know, this, this pandemic is at uh, serious levels, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that we close schools or whatever. And nobody wants to close schools, but at least that everybody wears a mask and, and we have distancing in classrooms, except he can't do that based on the, the law now because he has to get the agreement of the Council of State. Uh, and, and that's the way they have tried to curb his powers because you know the Council of State includes the Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State, all, the, all of the others. And all of them are not people who respect or like the governor. So that gives him some difficulty in terms of making those decisions that may be in the best interest of the children. The um, Excellent Public Schools Act is one that included, uh, and, and that's why I'm kind of missing notes, but anyway, that one included pieces like the science of reading. You remember that, that whole discussion about bringing in the science of reading in addition to the Read to Achieve program. And there was a lot of discussion around that in terms of there being one or two vendors who were offering that. And of course it had some research behind it in terms of using phonics, et cetera. But there were a lot of questions in terms of uh, those who proposed the bill, the sponsors, really wanted to use specific vendors that they had met with uh, to provide uh, the training to teachers, et cetera, because uh, it also included having uh, teachers having to go through the preparation and the training to be able to, to instruct the children. So I know people have a lot of problems with that. That bill includes a lot of different pieces and it is in law. Um, so it is it is going to be uh, real issues for a lot of the LEAs in terms of is it really an excellent schools act? Now I don't disagree that the we need to do something about making sure children are able to read by grade three and starting K. Um, it starts with early childhood development in the pre K and K in terms of making sure teachers are trained to help the children to read. Uh, and there are some uh, supplements, uh, but teachers have to pass, and I'm not looking at the bill, so, but I know that there were some additional bonuses in there 
I think $1,800 or $1,500 if the teachers uh, passed whatever the, the training regimen was. Uh, mm -hmm. And it also, you know, so there were some good pieces in there to help our children to achieve, uh, but it, it uh, probably poses some difficulty. And then the adjunct professors, I think, uh, included bringing in folk who may not be trained in the in uh, the pedagogy of education, but are career professionals to come in uh, to teach into in the classroom in those particular areas for limited periods of time. Uh, and there was a piece in there that helped in terms of. Um, professors at the universities uh, okay. being able to teach art, et cetera. So that's kind of what those are. 582 isn't a bad bill at all. Well, I was going to say, um, it looks like um, that 582 might actually help supplement yes. some of the issues around the teacher pipeline, especially right. in areas, um, specialty areas, special ed, uh, right. music, art, foreign art, language. Those. Yeah, that you might not be able to achieve in some of your smaller counties or midside counties or rural. So, so, um, so that would allow um, experienced faculty at, at universities and colleges to actually be eligible to teach in the school system without right. a lateral transfer or, or a teaching certificate. Okay. Um, all right. So that's kind of interesting. Are there any other pending bills? I, mean, I think you've already answered this question. So I think we can move on. Yeah, um, I don't I don't see any that are going to be taken up. <laughs> I'm with the representative. We're gonna get in there and do the redistricting if we have to and it will be out. Okay, so we'll we'll move on then. Um and Lynn, that takes us so we wanted to do a quick um look at Leandro and get some input from our guests right. tonight. Yeah. Just very briefly, I'm just gonna um talk about what happened in 2021. Um, so in March, um, you know, uh, Judge Lee accepted the comprehensive remedial plan that was agreed to by both parties. And then in June, he ordered the state to implement the remedial plan, expecting to see some of that funding or all of that funding in the state budgets. So we were waiting on the state budget at that point, and Judge Lee was. And then in November, citing, quote, woefully short budget proposals. So at this point he had seen the house proposal, he had seen the Senate proposal and he described them as quote, woefully short. He ordered the state to fund the remedial plan. And then um, in November, um, November in a two to one vote, um, the North Carolina Court of Appeals threw out that order um, that, that the you know, $1.7 billion from reserves um, be, you know, funded to fund Leandro, they threw that out. And that's the last update that I have about Leandro. And I thought I would pause here for um, the Senator and representative to add to this, if there's any information on Leandro or, or any comments you wanna make about Leandro. It's my understanding that the plaintiff, you know, appealed that decision and it's up at the Supreme Court and that also Senator Berger and uh, Speaker Moore had actually filed something called an intervener appeal because they have claimed all along that the legislature has never been quote unquote a party to this case, even though, you know, they really have uh, for 27 years, they could have gotten involved <laughs> as the legislature, but they've chosen not to. And then all of a sudden now they want to intervene. So they filed something with the court and it's my understanding the Supreme Court took up their, their intervener appeal so it's all like up on the docket at the supreme court but it's my understanding it hasn't been like set for a hearing or anything like that so um you know hopefully uh you know sometime early this year i mean obviously we their first priority is the redistricting case and then hopefully they'll get to this one next so senator yeah. do you have any other comments yeah i just wanted to add that uh you know i'm passionate about leandro because i was on the first closing the achievement gap commission uh -huh. with uh senator martin who was in my seat during that time and that was a long time ago when uh judge manning first determined that you know our children uh were entitled to to an equal uh education and equality uh, education. So it's, I'm passionate about that. 
Uh, and um, but it's it's a shame that uh, we had to be told to fund it when we know the needs of the children, all of those. And we know what it encompasses. Uh, the governor's office did a great job in terms of looking at uh, the plan in terms of what needs to be done. Uh, but the legislature just decided it didn't want to fund it because they didn't want the, the courts telling them what to do. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're, and, and our children are still suffering. They are suffering uh, because they don't have the resources. And now it's even worse after being out from COVID. Uh, so I, I do hope that in the short session, we're able to push forward and, and to, to do something about the additional money. I'm not sure, but I intend to push as hard as I can, and I'm sure the representative will too. Well, that real kind of quick, Yvonne, that. real quick before um, I move on for you to talk about the short session 2022, I just wanted to let our audience know there was a really good um, opinion piece written by a former Supreme Court justice and um, a former head of the North Carolina Bar Association arguing that the state is obligated and the court does have a right to um, require the legislature to come up with this funding, that the, the court is, the, that they do have the power to order that. And it's a great op-ed and we can share the link with um, you all, you know, after tonight's um, webinar. Well, so that really um, takes us right into the summary of what we just heard, right? So we'll find out if the courts have the right, because it's now sitting with the North Carolina Supreme Court, which um, uh, is very busy these days, right? With the redistricting and now Leandro um, sitting uh, in the wait. And uh, it'll be very interesting to see how that uh, case turns out. So we do want to just take a few minutes uh, and then we're going to open it up to our audience for their questions and their comments. Um, to talk about what we've learned tonight, that we hope that sometime in February after redistricting is settled, um, that the um, long session will adjourn uh, a year later, and that uh, we'll move into the spring and to opening what is called the short session in May. And we're wondering if you could kind of tell us, we're always confused about this, what will be eligible in the short session? I mean, what kind of legislation is, is eligible? What kind of adjustments, opportunities for the budget? Are there new budget uh, allotments that can be made? We're, we, we would really like you to give us a little tutoring here. I mean, that's really what the short session is for, is for budget adjustments. So, the, I mean, every session they they issue rules both in the House and the Senate about what kind of bills that you can file. So we're limited by those rules and obviously they haven't issued the rules, but if they're similar to years past, it's just really any anything that has funding. So that's the catch though, is that you can kind of file anything you want to if it has money associated with it, because then you can say it's a budget adjustment. So, you know, if it was like, I wanted to fund like the teaching fellows program, for example, you know, I could file a bill and just, you know, put money in it. And then that would be a budget adjustment. You can also, you know, file bills around constitutional amendments, redistricting, but you can't just file like a law change that doesn't have any money associated with it. Okay. So do you anticipate that there's some opportunities for um, uh, to do better, Senator, um, on the budget, especially for public education? When we look at this money sitting here, we look at the federal dollars, there are some still around, not much, I understand. Um, are, there, are there things that we should be advocating for? Well, well, certainly we should, certainly we should. We don't know if we'll get anywhere with it, but uh, certainly with public education, we should uh, advocate for that uh, in terms of the shortfall. We know the gaps. Uh, we know the gap in Leandro, and we certainly should advocate, and I will, and I'm sure the representative will, uh, to make sure that that's funded as well, too. So there's opportunity for that based on the rules, and, and just as she said, uh, they draw up, develop new rules, so we never know what they're going to say in terms of what we can't do. Um, uh, that's the disadvantage. 
but certainly uh -huh. we, we should focus. And I understand the other issue that should come forward is that there is a um, study group or commission on Medicaid expansion uh, right. that is supposed to come forward. Now, I don't know what's going to happen because I've been trying to get the information about where it has moved and I have not gotten any information about it route really meeting and I was a major part of that before uh, but I understand that that was supposed to come forward and oh, that remind that reminds me I just just to put on everybody's radar as far as like things that to look for this session is that in the house um well, like the senator mentioned they they I think it's a joint committee on Medicaid expansion or study mm -hmm. I'm like how much more do we need to study Medicaid <laughs> expansion? We know that it's the right thing to do. I think it's just a way to push, kick the can down the road personally. But um, the other thing is in the House, and I don't know if this is a joint committee, I was trying to look it up as you were talking, but there's a new committee. Um, oh, it's called the House Select Committee on an Education System for North Carolina's Future. Now this, scares me because I don't know what that means and I feel like it's going to be problematic <laughs> because I feel like it's a res I this is just me talking I feel like it's a response to Leandro like they're trying to say like because I'll if if I wanted to know what an education system for North Carolina's future what would be all I need to do is look at the Leandro decision and look at the West Ed report and you can see this is what we need to do for our education system in North Carolina. So why do we need a committee to talk about it? I feel like it might be a response to Leandro or some kind of alternative committee. Like they're going to say, that's not right. We're, let's come up with our own plan. So it's just something to keep your eye on. If when that committee starts meeting, I would be, I would, of course was not appointed to the committee. <laughs> I've never appointed to any education committee because they don't want me on there. But, um, they, you know, it's just something good to, uh, to be looking for and to watch those committees to see what they're going to be discussing. I wanted to mention. Is that a joint committee about uh, in the Senate and the House? It Did looks like it's uh Tor John John Torbett, who if you might know is the um House Committee Chair for Education and okay. Education Appropriation, and he has no experience in education, FYI. He is the senior chair of this committee. So that's an interesting tidbit as well. So okay. Yeah. So well, and, and I'm on the joint um Medicaid House Education Oversight Committee. Okay. So maybe we'll come through there, but I will keep my eyes open because there has been discussion about the university system as well, too. So we never know what they're cooking up. Yeah, yeah, whether it's K-12 or, or post there. Right. Yeah. Keep I your understand. eyes open for sure. Keep your eyes well, open. And, uh, and I do know there's some articulation pieces between that they're trying to change uh, how community colleges relate to K-12 and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I would, would say one last thing before we, um, we, we're going to open up the floor. Um, one of the things that um, comes to our attention as we look at some of the challenges, and hopefully these are opportunities, um, is how we can, you know, keep talking about universal breakfast, universal feeding of of children, you know, uh, hung, ch hungry children really, um, you know, disturbs me. And um, I think that, you know, we look at universal daycare, you know, pre-K. Um, I wonder if there's anyone in the House or Senate who's really interested in these issues around uh, trying to uh, make uh, universal pre-K happen. And when in the school system, looking for ways to improve uh, food programs in the school system? You, you know, I, I serve on the Southern Regional Education Board uh, and I just left, I was at a meeting in Atlanta with other legislators from the other Southern states. And I believe it's Mississippi that does that. Uh, I, was, I was really <laughs> floored to see how far ahead of us Mississippi has moved. Uh, the, you know, uh, really they're thinking in terms of how to address the gaps and the education of children has moved far ahead of us. And we're sitting back 
uh, arguing about it is crazy. But I think they have done that in terms of uh, uh, universal um, nutrition for all of the children, et cetera, and all. But uh, and I think there are some people who may be interested in in that in North Carolina in the legislature. Uh, I, I think we might be able to get some Republican buy-in to that. When you think of the surplus money, what better way could we spend it than to help working families and struggling um, children get ready for kindergarten and the universal pre-K, which actually helps all working parents? And what better way than allowing us to get the stigma out of being poor and hungry, um, you know, out of the nutrition program, right, where you can, you know, lunches and breakfasts are available for all, all children. So I hope that y'all can work on that. Uh, but let's go ahead now and open up the floor because we we hit the the hour mark and well, I want to. Yvonne, I think I think Representative Von Hafen wanted to comment about that universal breakfast. Well, you raised oh, no, your hand, Julie. I was just going to say that you know, in universal pre K and and preschool, we could have a whole nother webinar about oh, that, so I won't get into it. But. Um, Pre-K is part of Leandro. So once again, you know, we have to look back to Leandro and the fact that, you know, we could fund, you know, NC pre-K and all these slots, you know, another big bill we tried to run this year that unfortunately didn't get in the budget was to adjust childcare subsidy rates, which are antiquated to the nth degree around here and need to be updated. But it just reminded me when the Senator said, Mississippi is so much far ahead, I mean, you, if you want to read about a fantastic pre-K program in the South, Alabama is doing amazing things around pre-K. And look, all these states that we kind of look down on, like Alabama, Mississippi, like uh, they are doing fantastic things with Republican legislatures and governors who have finally, you know, acknowledged the fact that this is the key to their success in these states. And it's just frustrating that we can't really get that excitement to just do these tiny little things that we're trying to do here. So um, it's just, I just wanted to mention that. And Yvonne, let's do a whole webinar about pre-K sometime. And <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready because- All right. And then the thing that's related to it is, thank you for mentioning uh, what's related to it is what we pay our, our child care providers. Yeah, uh, yeah. Those, pay, those yeah. folks are out there providing that zero to five ch uh, child care. Right. Uh, most and many of them also providing the pre-K. Um, and in fact, some states are not just doing pre-K, they're doing pre, you know, three uh, pre-K and pre-four, right? They're doing three mm -hmm. and four-year-olds, mm -hmm. not just four-year-olds. And so there's some really dynamic data there. So I'm gonna take you up on that, Julie, because it's something that's a passion of mine and of a public schools first for the last, you know, since we began. So let's go ahead now um, and everybody, if you would, um, if you're interested in asking a question, if you would just raise your hand and you can address it to any of our uh, speakers or to uh, someone specifically, but if you have a question, you, uh, if you don't mind raising your hand, I, I will call on you. Uh, Anne, uh, Martha, you had a question. Unmute yourself and please speak up. Our, our hey. Yes, thank you. This is Anne Martha. And uh, I work for the State Board of Education and I put some very helpful links in the chat. The first hey. link, yes, they're, they're excellent links. The first link, and you all may want to subscribe to this, is our legislative update that is put out generally weekly, and it covers items that, uh, what happened at the state board meeting. I go through legislation on this, and uh, I put the link for today's legislative update, and it has some exciting news at the very front and highlights, and that's the second link I put in the chat. And then I also put the link to the new oversight committee. And uh, from that link, you can look at who's on that committee. It is a house select committee. And so it is only house members. And uh, yes, uh, Representative John Torbett is the chair and I have a link to his bio and to all of his bills. And then the final link is all of the reports that are based on education to the General Assembly. So that is also a very helpful link on the General Assembly website. And uh, please, please refer to them. I think everyone would get a lot out of our legislative update that goes out. 
and thank you. And and I need to give you a pat on the back uh, since you mentioned this. I actually am subscribed. We look at it almost every day. <laughs> it is a great place to to get a quick summary. Um, we do share out that information as well as our own legislative update on our website. We will include these links in our uh, thank you um, email that will go out afterwards. Thank you for coming and thank you for sharing that. Excellent work. And I think what you wanted to say is that the governor has said, um, I think well, the link that she's put here, if you want to talk about that, Anne, feel free. Oh, if you are a state employee or if you just have the heart to serve, jump in. Come on. This is a chance for you to get into the public schools and serve as a substitute, as someone that works in the cafeteria. If you have a CDL, come drive a bus. That would be awesome. So look at that link from the governor. It is allowing state employees to use their, uh, what do they call it? Their community service. Community service, thank you to go and work and help out at a school. And if you do work, they will also, especially as a sub, they pay you. So look at Great that. opportunity. It is an immense opportunity to serve and be a part of the solution to what's going on right now. And there's also another area, it's called EdCore, and that's also in that newsletter. EdCore is taking um, applications for people to tutor children and help with learning loss. So go through the uh, legislative update that was in, that's in the link or in the chat and see where you can help out. This is a year for us to all go beyond normalcy. So thank you so much. I hope uh, you all will read through that and subscribe. Thank you very much. And um, any, anybody else have co questions or comments or, or things to share? I just wanted to say thank you, Anne, for putting this um links but uh, and i just wanted to say speaking of the select committee that i mentioned if you go on that link you can sign up to get their notifications when they meet and they'll send you an email and you can listen to the committees online so that's a good way to stay in touch with what's going on so representative von hafen in my newsletter i put the link in the newsletter so it's <laughs> right there i made it so easy you're too good okay. uh, let me go ahead and call on guy you had your hand up um, yes, I was just wondering, is there any accountability for the uh, private school voucher program, any data, um, anything that is that we can look at to see if the program is working? That's one of the big problems, actually, with the voucher program is that there isn't a lot of data um, that they keep on. And that's why, you know, I think Senator Yvonne or somebody said, you know, that the big problem with it is the accountability, that there's not a lot of data. They don't really follow up with like following that student to the school to see, you know, if that student that, that got that voucher money, you know, if their grades, you know, went up or their test scores are going up. Um, you know, I don't think that they really, we really have any way to, to track that. And that's one of the big criticisms of the program is that there's not a lot of that um, accountability associated with the money. Right. And, and the, uh, the legislation did mention a report, but it doesn't say a report about what. <laughs> there's no specific, you know, so uh, you're, you're right in terms of no accountability there. And you okay. mentioned, I was going to say, Guy, in your question, you mentioned, you know, whether is there data, like, does that student stay at that school or, or return to the public school? I mean, no, I don't think that there's really a lot of data with that either. And I'm sure that if you don't know, you know, the money, it's not like it comes back with the student, you know, after they return to their public school, if the private one doesn't work out. So then the, the private school gets the money and then the student goes back and the money stays at that private school. So that's another big problem I see with it. Okay. Anyone else? Just raise your hand and, and feel free to speak up here. Um, one of the things that um, I thought about, uh, Senator and Representative, when you were talking about the cutting the budget, well, let me stop. Nathan has raised um, a hand. Let me call on Nathan. Thank you. I'll get back to my comment. Um, connected to this question of oversight on the 
vouchers, I'm also wondering about oversight of charter schools. Yeah, uh, same problem. <laughs> uh, you know, as you know, we've, we've been expanding the charter school program, you know, here in the state for, for a long time. Now, the state does have, you know, a charter school office. That might be why Anne's raising her hand. Um, Anne, did you want to answer? Sure, thank you. This is Ann Mercer from the State Board of Education, and there is an annual report that is done uh, concerning the charter schools, and if, if you look in one of the links that I put in the chat, it is it's all the reports regarding education, and that was for this past year, and you can go back, and from that same link, you should be able to go back into the archives. So the charter schools do a report annually. And they have other reports. They have uh, meetings monthly to review all of the charter schools and make sure that they are up to snuff. So they are rigorously, uh, they have a rigorous oversight policy and, and standards. Yeah, and I wanted to add that there are reports for charter schools, but one of, one of the issues uh, in the legislation this year is uh, the plan to what I call uh, not require some of them to do the planning year. And the planning year has been required before a charter school would be allowed to move forward for application. And to, to take that out, uh, I think is a mistake. And it will allow some that have not had the rigor addressing the questions, et cetera, to move forward, to open up, pull in students, et cetera. Uh, so I think that that is a another problem since the you know the cap is off of charter schools so we can have as many as as come forward with applications I think that the reporting is better but then when you open it up like that and you don't have a planning year you don't have the rigor required etc to see what the comparison is and I think the language says something about as long as there's some piece about them being equivalent to um, the school system in that area, the LEA in terms of performance or something. Uh, but we have to look at, at, at the whole, all of the legislation, but we need to make sure that they are still required to have that plan a year. So people can really take a look at what it is you say you're gonna do, what, you know, what kind of teachers do you have, What's the, uh, you know, what, what, what's the curriculum? Is it the standard course of study? All of those things, all those questions need to be addressed in, in, in the planning year. And I I'll just add, uh, can I just add real quick, Yvonne, that um, I filed a bill this past year, and Nathan, if you want to look it up, it's House Bill 920, and it was a charter school omnibus, and it basically addressed every single thing that's wrong with charter schools in the state and the fact that, you know, we, they don't have transportation, they don't have meals, teachers don't have to be licensed, you know, they don't have to have anti-discrimination and anti-bullying policies like public schools. So my bill would have basically just brought charter, they, they are public schools and they fall under the public school, you know, system, but they don't have to do a lot of the same things that public schools have to do. So what my bill would have done is just bring them up to where and have all the same things that public schools have. And so if we're gonna treat them in that way, then we, they have to have all these other things. And that's when I say that they're not accountable, I guess I was meaning more in that respect than you know they, they do have reporting and all those kind of things, but they need to have a, all these other things as well. And I'll try yeah. to put the link to the bill in the, in the chat if I have time, but... Um, that might help you don't you. we'll, we'll send you. it on later if we okay. don't find it by the time we um hang up and Yvonne before you finish your question you started a few minutes ago there are some questions in the chat that I can read when you're ready oh okay well thank you Lynn I, I forgot to look in the chat I'm so busy um paying attention <laughs> to the uh, everyone's great questions and comments I've, I've lost the chat so I just wanted to say though I do think it was kind of ironic that we were talking about Senator you were talking about the loss that we are planning we're going to see in the overall funding when we low, lower the uh, corporate tax rate and the loss we're going to see and what are we going to do to 
uh, where are we going to get those education dollars? I would tell you that it made me laugh because I'm thinking, well, the voucher program is getting taken care of. They're squirreling away millions and billions of dollars in that account that should last them for quite some time through 2030. They have a, an abundance of a surplus. So even without the corporate, the money from the corporate tax, the voucher program is solid, right? And that's unfortunate that, um, that, that just I thought was ironic. I'm sorry, y'all, that was a little cynical. Um, so Lynn, what are some questions in the chat? The one we have um, from a very good friend of ours, are there Republicans in the General Assembly that are more um, willing to listen about Leandro and support Leandro funding? And if so, you know, who are they? Because our supporters and other advocates would be willing to reach out to those folks. You know, are, there, are they there? Who are they? And would it actually, um, some pressure from the public, would that help them actually vote accordingly? Have you found any, Senator Robinson? <laughs> well, the, the, the one that was there left, uh, that was Rick. <laughs> <laughs> Rick Horner. And he and I could work together. And I think they just kind of pushed him out. When you find some that'll half work, I think they kind of pushed him out. Uh, but. <laughs> But I would say the same thing on the House side with Representative <laughs> Horn, who used to be the education right. chair, just like right. Senator Horner on the Senate side, and they're both <laughs> gone. So, you know, what does that tell you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but I would say that I, if, you know, people ought to reach out to the education chairs in both the House and the Senate, because one of the things that is missing is that the chairs of these committees who appointed don't have really any educational background. They have none. Um, you know, they may have, uh, maybe they visited some schools by now, but in terms of either practicing or uh, teaching or, you know, having worked in the area, you know, I've only taught at the university level, so I've not taught, but I've been in education since <laughs> eons as a parent, as a PTA, and all the way through the Board of Governors, et cetera. But the folk who are there really need to be educated. So I say reach out to them and educate them about issues because sometimes is that, you know, they aren't listening to us, That's right. but they need to be educated by the public in terms of what are those issues uh, that really are concerned and what does it mean? And that's what I say to teachers all the time. Don't come talk to me because I'm your, you know, I listen and I'm your buddy and I don't mean for you not to come talk to me, but I want you to talk to them and tell them the issues that are going on. So, so I think we have to keep trying. Okay, and Lynn, we got about 10 minutes left. There's, what are some other questions in there? Just, I think the last person I'd love to hear from if she, if she's willing is Christine Kelly. Um, she's going to have some great comments about the corporate tax rate and businesses that came to Holly Springs. Christine, are you willing to unmute? I am. Hey, everyone. Um, right. I mean, we, we attracted some fabulous companies and they were pretty excited about coming to our town, but a lot of it was because of the land. Um, we have a pretty big parcel of land that was available that we've been kind of having in our industrial park. So there were other factors that brought people there. We were up against Texas and Texas had that big snowstorm. So, I mean, you never know at the very end why people pick uh, North Carolina, but um, while, while you guys were talking, the one thing I did want to point out that's another charter school pain to communities is, you know, the legislature uh, is that we cannot force schools to make any infrastructure changes or upgrades to the community. And I voted against having a, you know, a charter school come to our town because it was almost in the middle of town, Pine Springs Academy. We knew it was gonna be like the local communities didn't want it because it was just too much traffic. Um, and the burden is for the town to figure out how to build sidewalks and widen the roads and do all these things because charter schools are off the hook. And when we were looking at the plans for that school, I was concerned that if it comes where that charter school is no longer a charter school and the public, it becomes a public school, 
there was no bus lane, there was no, I mean, there's all these things like if this one day would become a charter, a, a public school, it would, it would not have everything it needs. So it was very hard. I mean, um, charter schools can almost do what they want and it's, it's a burden on the communities. Thank and you I, so much. So you were obviously on town council and are you now? I am not. <laughs> um, I ran for mayor and I didn't win. So now I have to find other ways to get involved. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I do wanna say um, just in closing here is we're, we're, if anyone has one burning last question, I think I can squeeze one in. Does any, anybody else have um, a question? Did we miss anybody who feels left out? Uh, honestly, I, 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 we have a few minutes. Okay. I don't Yvonne, I wanted to, can I mention, I wanted to mention the High School Athletic Association piece. Uh, okay. So people know that uh, that was a piece that was targeted by a couple of senators uh, because of their own personal issues. Uh, unfortunately, when people come to Raleigh, instead of them looking out for the good of the public, they come in with their own personal agendas. So that was their own personal agendas by a couple of the senators, McGinnis and, and um, um, can't remember the others, but that's what it was about. But what has happened is that, and people all across the state said, don't bother the association. However, what happened in the conference report is that the State Board of Education has been given the authority to set up a memorandum of agreement with them if they do it within a certain period of time. I think up to four years, they can set up an agreement. And then the State Board has been given the authority, that really that it had to me, uh, to, to make rules for appeals and, and several of the other issues. So. Uh, hopefully there is some working together between the state board and the high school athletic association. It's not what ideally was wanted, but it was a compromise. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and, and as we're kind of, I'm, I'm posting in here right now in the chat, a link to um, our conference that we held back in October that talked about the privatization of our public schools. And it talks a lot, we had a lot of great speakers that talked about charters and vouchers. So I encourage you if you get a chance to um, go to that link and look at that. So Sean, I see that you raised your hand. I do have a quick question. I am a state employee and a parent of two young children in Wake County Schools. And I started the process to be a substitute teacher today. And I was wondering if anybody knew why the governor is only extending the temporary program through February 15th. I'm hoping I can get the process done before then. I don't know how long it takes. And I'm uh, very I, glad that he Julie did. But. Or Gladys, anybody have any, Ann, anybody wanted to, I, I assume that's probably just a, because of the, the nature of, that we're in the middle of this COVID crisis. And I'm assuming Omicron. that- Omicron. Yeah, Ann, did you say, raise your hand again? Yes, this is Ann Murtha. I am guessing that he is having it only to February 12th, hoping that we will be done with this variant. I, I can't understand why it wasn't extended longer, but when you do apply your, um, your days that you can use for, I always forget that, because I have never used my, my days. What do you call it? community service? Community days. service. Oh. It's only 24 hours. So it's There's three 24 days. 24 hours. So three days. But you could still use them based on your supervisor's approval. So yes, you can use them for anything in public schools at NC State, I know. Mm -hmm. Uh, you're allowed. If you say you're tutoring in a school, you're proctoring in a school, it, it doesn't matter. Normally, you can do it. The other great area that has uh, been instituted is EdCore. And that's also in that newsletter that's linked. And that is a fabulous program that allows anyone to get paid to come into the school and they will teach you how to tutor the kids. It's a marvelous, uh, marvelous uh, opportunity for anyone who would like to get into the schools. Okay, well, I am going to have to wrap it up here right now. And I think move to the 
to uh, just a few little announcements that 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 I want to make, and I want to start the, it with by thanking you very much, Senator Robinson, and very much, Julie von Hapen. I hope that our audience, not just here tonight, but we have lots of people who registered who can't make it tonight, um, you know, because of just what we're talking about today, COVID and school and kids and exams. But we're, we'll have this recording and it will be posted on our YouTube channel. And I hope that everybody will know that these two uh, elected officials are knowledgeable, they're resourceful, they're great people to go to when you have a question and you need information and you want some guidance. And I really appreciate very much you giving us your time tonight. I also want to just tell you that we have a series of webinars coming up and there's uh, a two or three every month, I think, Lynn, uh, for the next couple of months. And we're really excited about the next one. And it really touches on, Julie, and uh, uh, what a question I had to you about the feeding program and, and Senator Robinson, uh, because it talks about poverty, child poverty in North Carolina. And, it, and I hope that you'll join us. Um, Jean Nickel and Heather Hunt are two attorneys who are brilliant researchers on top of everything else. The report is, is, is um, uh, it, it's shocking to look at some of the numbers in terms of the children in our uh, family. Um, just yesterday, I looked in the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction's website, and the superintendent had posted a report from last year, and it stated that 60% of our children in North Carolina in our school in our schools qualify for free or reduced lunch. That is startling. So please join us on January 27th for this program on. Um, uh, uh, with uh, the on January 20th of the child poverty. And then we have an important uh, couple of webinars coming up. We wanna look at school social workers. This year they were left out of the extra bonus money. We're gonna bring some legislators back to find out what was going on. So please join us. So thank you all for your time and attention. And Lynn, if you would just uh, wrap us up. Yep, so I just wanna call your attention to our YouTube channel. When you look us up on YouTube, you're gonna find the home page. And the reason I've got videos circled, when you click on the YouTube home page for us, for our channel, you don't see every all of the content. So if you click on the videos tab, you'll see all of our previous webinars, a lot of really great videos there that are, you know, you can access anytime that you've, you've got the time to watch and you can see the subjects listed there. And then finally, we're wrapping up. Um, this is how you follow us, contact us. We would love for you to subscribe to our newsletter. We send it out about once a week, sometimes not that often when they're not in session, um, but they kept us busy in 2021. So it's the best way to um, stay up to date with what's happening at the legislature. And we would love to hear from you. So please email us with questions and follow us on social media. And we really, really appreciate all of your time. I wanna join Yvonne in thanking the Senator and Representative for doing this with us and for our great attendees, we really appreciate it. And the video should be up in a couple of days. It'll be on that YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody. Stay safe this weekend with the weather rolling in and we'll see you soon. Good night. <laughs>